I'm from the University of Utah, and uh, this is a little bit of a story about how we came to uh, discover a few technical issues uh, and safety issues having to do with assays in general. So, uh, as you can see, I'm going to be talking about SARS-CoV-2, which has brought the uh, issue up uh, for uh, specific consideration. I normally take care of cystic fibrosis patients. They are infected with all kinds of things. Uh, in cystic fibrosis, there are no great animal models until recently when the pig model was developed at the University of Iowa. So pigs are you know, 300 to 600 pounds and not necessarily very um, friendly. So it's quite a bad model in that way. You have to have a team of large animal veterinarians. And so for most of my career, I've either dealt with data, which is completely non-infectious, of course, um, or human samples. Uh, and those human samples, you should consider them infectious. But if you have a normal immune system, you tend not to just sort of pick up multi-resistant uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa or any of the strange species that we find. So it was really quite a shock to start thinking about applying some of the things that we learned about biomarkers in cystic fibrosis to looking at the pneumonia and chronic illnesses uh, associated with COVID-19. And so that's how we came about realizing, oh, we're going to have to up our game in terms of infection handling uh, so that we don't, well, early on, it was we don't kill ourselves by infecting ourselves with human samples. Uh, and that, that ran the gamut from even going into the space where the patients were, collecting the samples, developing the methods and the uh, protections, transportation, storage, all those things. But one of the most important things, if, if you have samples and you can't analyze them because you can't handle them safely, you're stuck. Uh, so before I get any further, uh, just a few disclosures. I, as you can see, I have funding from the CF Foundation. Um, I have NIH uh, funding for CF research and then a couple of private uh, concerns. I do all kinds of clinical studies um, where I'm the local PI uh, and have some uh, feedback to the companies. And then I'm currently on the CF Foundation Clinical Research Study Review Committee. Okay, I'm here not because I'm a um, contractor. I, I'm actually here as an actual collaborator because early on when we started handling these samples, I called up uh, BioLegend people, so Avi Perna and then later uh, Miguel, and, and was asking them about the assays and how to handle samples. And it turns out that my questions uh, were not uncommon. In fact, they were actually quite common. And so it, it ended up, uh, from your point of view, my showing up here to give this little talk. So the goals, I wanted people to come away from this understanding that there are biosafety concerns uh, from handling SARS-CoV-2 uh, samples, never mind standing there while a patient coughs or, or spits um, right next to you and you're trying to collect a sample. Um, <clears throat> We looked, we ended up focusing on two protocols. There were some others that we looked at but have not proceeded with because these were the two most promising. Um, and there are limitations to using these protocols on actual human samples. So I want you to understand all that. Uh, just a quick review, I don't think anyone here really needs much. Uh, Six million deaths worldwide, apparently that's a tremendous undercount, so somewhere between 15 and 20 million is now the expected number, including the indirects. Um, about a million in the United States. Uh, it is highly contagious, and it has been doing its best to uh, imitate measles. I think the r not for measles is somewhere around 18. Uh, I believe that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is beginning to make moves towards double digits on that uh, R naught. So uh, we'll see. It is it is linked to this higher spike protein mutation rate. So early on in the pandemic, some of the apparent good news was that there's an RNA correction mechanism inside SARS-CoV-2. And so the thought was that the virus would be stable 
that uh, any vaccine would be effective for quite a long time and that maybe we wouldn't have to do what we're doing now, which is uh, getting boosters for people, uh, you know, something like every five to six months, uh, which is a huge burden and does not, does not predict that we're going to do well eradicating or really tightly controlling this disease. Uh, so it's going to be around, uh, highly contagious, and so are the samples. Um, and I think there's been a lot of questions around the mechanisms of disease and death. So we know that there's unbridled inflammation. We don't actually know how that inflammation gets started or is uh, continued or ends up uh, creating lung disease. Different mutations have led to different manifestations of the disease in terms of where it affects the respiratory tree. So the original disease really caused uh, an acute respiratory distress syndrome in people that you did not expect to get ARDS from a viral infection. Right? Our previous uh, experience, I think, with lots of viruses is that it was only a very rare portion of the patients who ended up with ARDS. And with, uh, with SARS, between high infectivity and its, its ability to infect all the way down the respiratory tree, we ended up with enormous numbers of ARDS patients. The current Omicron strains do not seem to cause quite as much, and actually that's not understood. So even though it's less dramatic in some ways, there's a continued need to understand what's going on with the inflammation. Um, a term that I hear tossed around and has been tossed around for 30 years at least is uh, uh, cytokine networks and cytokine storm. And I don't really recall uh, many papers that have tried to take that term beyond just a catchy and scary idea. Right, so are there quantitative models looking at this cytokine or that cytokine versus some other? And are they linked to clinical outcomes? There's actually very, very little work done like that. And I think part of the problem is that the assays are diff difficult to do, even when you don't have infectivity concerns. Um, and then there's this whole notion of, well, if you're working with human samples anyway, uh, how do you know? that what you're finding is actually more than an association. Um, is, it, is it causal? Is it not? Is it just sort of incidental? So they're both caused by something else? And if you find these associations, do you really know which way the causal arrow might point? I mean, we think we have great stories sometimes, and it turns out that they're completely wrong. Uh, so there's a lot of work left to do. Uh, and so there's reason to try and figure out, well, how do we do this without hurting anybody? Okay, so um, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 infections and human studies. So there have been hundreds of millions of potential subjects. It turns out to be incredibly difficult to collect samples uh, that are usable in uh, human studies. And the, and the reasons are um, that um, we really oftentimes don't have any idea about when somebody actually got an infection, right? We are not running around asking for volunteers to say, here, take a nose full of this uh, mysterious fluid, and we're just going to start a stopwatch here and watch things, right? We can't do that. It's ethically completely unacceptable. Um, what we can do is ask things like, when was your test done? It was a positive or negative? Or when did you start having symptoms? And of course, um, I know this is a much more basic science crowd, but the issues with those kinds of questions is the farther out you get, the less exact and the less precise the memories are. So um, I used to say that with influenza, um, we, that was the one virus where you could ask someone, when did your symptoms start? And they could come back with something like two days ago at two in the afternoon, suddenly I, was, I just felt like I'd been hit by a truck. And for those of you who've had influenza, you, you may relate to that story. For most other viruses, it's pretty uh, insidious. You don't feel quite right. Make you, maybe you think you're just tired. Maybe you get some aches and pains. 
Uh, at some point, maybe you get hit with some fever and cough. And my experience with these patients through the pandemic has been that that actually is kind of the history of SARS-CoV-2. The patients have a symptom, and it's not a dramatic, all of a sudden they're short of breath. Uh, you know, there's plenty of stories about people who are hypoxic and don't feel short of breath. Uh, but there's also people who just, they do get short of breath, they do feel the hypoxemia, but it still came on gradually. And so it's a very difficult target to try and figure out, well, what is the timing of your sample compared to the disease progression? Um, I like to say that humans are free range because we decide what we're going to eat, we decide what medications we'll take, uh, we decide what exposures we'll get, and it just all of those things just make human research much, much more difficult. The, the payoff, of course, is that if you can handle all the, um, the compromises, all the pieces of data that you don't know, then you end up with, I think, a much more immediate great understanding of human disease. What you don't typically get is a causal arrow direction or, or even the existence that something is causing, uh, is actually causing something. What you end up with are hypotheses. You have very tight associations. Sometimes you have terrible associations. You can do all kinds of false discovery rate um, evaluations. And if you are careful and a little lucky, you end up with associations that mean something, uh, that make some sense against literature, and then also suggest which way you should start designing uh, experiments to look for causality. All right, so let's get into the mechanics of this because that's where we're headed. <laughs> so this is, collection of human samples, as I said, is kind of difficult. So what we were doing was going down to the emergency room and asking, who's here who looks sick? And are you planning to do any kind of viral test? So if they were going to get a viral test, uh, we would go in and we'd be wearing N95 or better respirators, usually self-powered high, uh, high efficiency uh, particulate uh, filters. Uh, goggles, which for someone with uh, who needing reading glasses is actually really tough. Uh, we impervious gowns and gloves. Uh, in the clinical setting, oddly enough, you're only you're only required to wear a single layer of gloves. Uh, the institutional biosafety people were like, you know, we really think you ought to have two layers. Um, but in a clinical setting, uh, that's typically just one layer, and for for one. One small thing that um, I didn't discover until we were trying to do the double layer thing is that not all brands of gloves allow you to put one pair over another without like making you look completely silly. Uh, so things to think about that you don't until you ha actually have to protect somebody. Uh, patients in our institution were isolated. If they weren't in an actual negative pressure room, they were in a, pressure, in a room where there was this enormous fan uh, leading to a duct that they had jury-rigged. Uh, and so it was HEPA-filtered uh, exhaust as well as uh, negative pressure because of that huge fan. Um, there were actually uh, a lot of engineering issues that came up in our hospital, uh, even though it's relatively new because if you put too many fans like that, you can reverse flow in other places. Uh, and uh, you can also make it difficult to, to exit the facility because the doors are so, uh, you know, shut tight. So it's a, it was actually uh, a whole different story that's fascinating. Um, there was controlled visitation, which was at the beginning of the pandemic horrendous because it basically was no one can come in except the patient. And so sometimes patients came in and that was the last that the rest of the family ever saw of them. Um, lots of tragic scenes down there in the ER and elsewhere. Uh, let's see. So as you know, it was originally a report, the, the virus originally was reported as a droplet spread and that there wasn't that much to be concerned about, that just a surgical mask would do okay. And that kind of went away January 2020, but I've had conversations with various researchers who said, no, we had grave suspicions about this uh, very early, like when the uh, Chinese were reporting uh, 
from Wuhan, the spread of this strange pneumonia in uh, in their city, it was already beginning to suspect be suspected that it was airborne, and that was updated to um, the correct. Uh, assessment that it, it is an airborne virus beginning in January to February 2020. So as I said before, it's now approaching the infectiousness of measles, which makes it, um, well, terribly dangerous. Uh, so lab handling, so I, I talked already about clinical handling. Uh, you put it into a container that's sealed, you put it in a biosafety bag, theoretically everything's great. Uh, I think there are more issues than that because you can contaminate the outside of the vials, you can contaminate the outside of your bags. Uh, you have to be very careful transporting these things. The nice thing about plastic bags is that they're very difficult to tear. Uh, so if you can get it sealed and you're reasonably sure that you haven't um, uh, contaminated the outside surface, then you're pretty okay to handle it until you can get it to some kind of containment facility. So inside the lab, I think the initial lab handling was exclusively BSL-3 or above. Uh, the biosafety committee at the University of Utah said absolutely no handling unless uh, you're really careful. We don't have, or at the time we did not have any BSL-3 facilities. Uh, that actually turns out to be a lot less common than you might think. Uh, and after some time, they decided, uh, and I think there was just a worldwide realization that we had to do something about this, uh, it was modified to be BSL-2+. And so what that means is that you use BSL-3 procedures, but you have BSL-2 equipment. And whatever you do, you're not allowed to do anything that looks like a viral culture. So uh, early in the pandemic, I think you could not get testing, for example, for hepatitis um, with, well, sorry, not hepatitis, herpes viruses um, or other viruses, other viral cultures, because you had no idea whether you were actually going to culture out uh, COVID or SARS-CoV-2 instead of HSV or something else. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that if you are in the business of doing viral culture, that whatever facility you have is going to be sufficient to contain SARS-CoV-2. But I think the, the chance of making a mistake that turns out to be really harmful to people uh, goes up the less intense your equipment is. So in the case of studying things like biomarkers and not doing anything that looks like a cell culture, uh, they, are, they were and they continue to allow uh, this BSL-2+, plus, which means that the number of labs able to look at samples is really exponentially larger. So focusing in, um, you know, I, I got in touch with uh, BioLegend people because of our desire to measure various biomarkers. And so just, um, it, it, was, it was clear given the cytokine storm kind of descriptions, that this was not a single plate ELISA kind of uh, investigation. So as you all know, sandwich assays, ELISAs, you get one analyte, you get a uh, single use of whatever sample aliquots are needed for that plate. Uh, but the nice thing about it is that you get fine tuning of the sample dilutions after you do some scout assays so that you can actually design a standard curve that exactly takes advantage of the samples that you have. All right, the multi-analyte approach, um, which is what we ended up using, uh, allows you to measure a bunch of things per plate in the case of the kit that we were using, 13, and you get multiple measurements out of a single sample, which is terrific. It saves sample, which are incredibly difficult to get. The problem is that anytime you can't dilute the individual components, right, individually. So you end up having to make some compromise about dilutions and standards. The, uh, the kit that we've been using has uh, two sets of ranges for the analytes. Uh, there's a higher and a lower. And that is a accommodation because different proteins occur at different uh, concentrations in, in uh, these human fluids. Um, going on, just some of the details we had to go through, proper storage, you know, sealed containment, I've talked about that, proper labeling. 
I think there's about six of the early samples that we have that I think I've spent a total of 24 hours uh, making sure that we have the right sample labeling because uh, we did not have the sample system set up uh, initially uh, and we were getting samples from three other clinical studies so each each study had its own numbering system and so I had to like translate them uh, to ours uh, when you're trying to do this in a hurry, what you end up doing is paying later on by uh, having to audit the labels every time. Um, once you're using them, the BSL-2 Plus procedures, viral inactivation at the earliest handling point becomes a big safety topic for biosafety committees. Right? They want to know how long are these samples going to be dangerous, how secure is the storage, um, when you do your assays, are you potentially going to expose anyone to the agent that's in that sample? And so there is an impetus to just inactivate the virus as soon as possible. Um, and so there are a bunch of methods, right? I mean, obviously you can just incinerate your sample, but of course you're not going to get any data out of it that way. And so, you know, just kind of a partial list of the things that are out there. Uh, antiseptics, these have been around for over a century. You know, the 10% bleach, 70% ethanol, a whole lot of other things on the ethanol, uh, on the EPA list uh, N, which you can look up. I think I've got, yeah, the link is right there on the slide. Uh, and I'm happy to supply that to anyone who doesn't already have it. Uh, heat inactivation, there are lots of protocols uh, that are specific for SARS-CoV-2. Most of them are destructive of lots of things. Uh, as you can imagine, 67 degrees centigrade for 60 minutes will denature most proteins. Uh, so that's a problem, unless you've got some kind of protein that just doesn't care. Um, and then fixation, right? So 4% formaldehyde or 10% glutaraldehyde will kill just about anything. But again, they, they make it impossible, uh, mostly, to look at uh, epitopes. And then, of course, detergents, which were known to deactivate the virus pretty early. Um, what I discovered when I was looking through literature trying to understand some of the possibilities was that there actually is a very small literature on how to safely handle some of these things. I was specifically looking for SARS uh, from the 2002 uh, outbreak that was contained. Uh, the papers uh, showed up as late as 2006. Uh, there were some earlier papers from this same group that uh, came out in 2004. So several, several years after the beginning and end of that outbreak. And then since then, not a whole lot. Although, uh, as an aside, I guess, th the work on the mRNA vaccine started in 2002 uh, with SARS. And so did uh, the work on Paxlovid. I'm not quite sure about the other drug that's out there. But anyway, those, um, those efforts started in 2002 or so, and we're the beneficiaries now. Like I said, that's an aside. Okay, so immunoassays are sensitive to fixation and detergents, and mostly they become unusable. But the question actually that we asked was, well, how long an exposure? Like, can you get away with a few minutes or a few hours? Um, can you get away with cutting down the amount of exposure and still have an assay that work? that works, and I, and I was going to say that um, there are some clues out there that you can use immunoassays after some exposures. Um, the, the instructions with the BioLegend Human Antivirus Response Panel actually include some instructions about you can fix your samples and then read them uh, if you do it quick enough, but there's not a lot of detail provided, and, uh, and so we were thinking, and we had some conversations about, well, what is the extent of this? You know, how much exposure, how long? So this is a slide made uh, from a unfortunate patient of mine who passed away. And uh, this, this lung tissue was fixed in 4% paraformaldehyde for days to weeks. A paraffin uh, block was made. And then several years later, we had this bright idea and asked for uh, sections from that block. And what you're seeing here is a result of taking that block, uh, cutting it, um, I believe these are three micron uh, thickness uh, slides, 
extracting the paraffin with xylene and 70% ethanol. So all of these things will kill virus, okay? Um, but then we added anti-HMGV1 antibody. So HMGV1 is a nuclear protein. It, without it, there is no life. It turns out that it moonlights as a uh, indicator of inflammation. Right? As a nuclear protein, if it gets loose in your circulation, it's definitely not supposed to be there. And so it's considered a danger uh, signal. Uh, and so it causes inflammation. And so it is exclusively supposed to be in nuclei. So nuclei here are labeled with DAPI. And that's not an antibody uh, response, but the HMGB1 is, uh, is an antibody-based response. And so this is a sample that has been stored, has been fixed in every poss possible way, and yet you can get an antibody to work. I think everyone knows this because we've all seen slides like this. Um, the other place that we uh, were wondering is that there are uh, all kinds of fixatives uh, to preserve cells for, for flow cytometry. And one of my colleagues uh, stained, uh, well, we collected saliva and then um, used a preservative that contained some detergent and we ended up holding it for a month before the cy uh, flow cytometry was done. So this was actually just with EPCAN and anti-CD45 antibodies, just to try and figure out, well, what is in saliva after you get sick with COVID-19? Turns out there are epithelial cells. We expected that. But then there was also this influx of immune cells. And it, this is an area of real interest because no one actually was suspecting that there would be this influx of immune cells so early. Right, these are patients who are three to five days out from their first symptom in general. So detergents don't completely wipe out your ability to use antibodies. And so we went from those two observations to uh, investigating, well, how much can you use? We, we started with detergents. Um, Avi uh, and Miguel were kind enough to recruit some of the scientists at BioLegend to look at this. And the idea here was that you could preserve a sample with a low concentration of detergent, inactivate the virus, and, um, and uh, be able to do the assay later. Um, what we knew from other viruses, dengue, um, uh, dengue, let's see here, yellow fever, a few others, um, was that if you soak these viruses in very low doses of detergent, you would get non-detection within about four hours. And so the principle that I've been taught is that once you get no detection, you have to double, or you have to add another increment in time, because you don't actually know how long it takes beyond that level of detection threshold before you actually have no virus. And the reality is that you're not allowed to ever consider that sample completely virus free. You just know that you can't detect it and you've built in a margin of safety. And so the suggestion was that, yeah, it's four hours to non-detection, but then it's eight hours um, to increase the margin of safety. So uh, the BioLegend scientists uh, were kind enough to take a look at 1% Triton X100 uh, and Tween 80, and also both of these with uh, uh, TNBP. <laughs> Phosphate, so it's another kind of a detergent-like ingredient. And uh, basically those results showed that if you used anything with Triton 100 in it, you really couldn't measure IL-10 anymore. Uh, it just became completely unreliable no matter what you did. With um, Tween 80, if you use the TNBP, um, you lost the ability to look at IL-10 and IP-10 in cell culture samples, cell culture derived samples. And in serum samples, you lost the ability to look at TNF-alpha and IP-10. So this is a nice list of three of the maybe four or five most important biomarkers that people have been looking at in uh, SARS-CoV-2. So this suggested that these, t these three combinations were not useful. But there was uh, 
kind of a promising lead with 1% tween 80. That it appeared that there was only a small impact on TNF alpha measurements from serum. Uh, and it didn't appear like there were other major issues from that initial work. So we, uh, in my lab, we went ahead and started looking at, well, under kind of ideal conditions, so explainable, unidentifiable proteins in the mix, just take the actual standard solutions, which are very well behaved and well characterized, and see what happens when the only thing we do to them is uh, put in tween 80. So we used the tween 80 standards as the control curve, and then we incubated those same solutions, so absolutely no, well, theoretically no variation, right? We still have pipetting issues, but theoretically no variation, and incubated with four, 0, 4, 8, and 16 hours with a 1% tween 80. And, um, what we, so we were basing the, these times on the fact that we really couldn't go below four because that's the number that people accept as this is what it takes to inactivate virus. We threw in the eight hour because that's the biosafety margin of safety um, time. And then I was talking to my technicians, right? So if you're a physician, you don't necessarily know what goes into doing something. Uh, and so I said, well, you know, how realistic are these times? And the answer is, well, in a busy lab, if you bring back a sample, so if I go to the ER, uh, so patients don't tend to come in until like, the afternoon. If you don't feel well, you just don't come in in the morning. I mean, if you can drag yourself out of bed or wherever and go to the ER in the morning when you're sick, it's great. Nobody's there. Um, and so by the afternoon, the place is jam-packed, and that's when you get all your samples. Well, by the time, you know, for me, it took 20 minutes per sample. So talk to the patient, get informed consent, actually collect the sample, do some clinical annotation so we know, you know, age, sex, hypertension, that sort of stuff, uh, so we can interpret any results. So by the time that I got done with co sample collection, we're talking about 4, 5, or 6 p.m. And that's not a good time to start any kind of assay. So basically at that point, it's just a couple of hours of sample prep to get into the freezer or into preservative of some sort. And so to think that you could use a assay right away is not realistic. So best case, if you get in there at 4 o'clock with your samples and you wait 16 hours to do the assay, uh, you're talking about starting an assay at 8 in the morning. That's perfect. All right, so that's why we threw in the 16-hour time. Um, okay, so here are results, right? <laughs> it's like, is this guy going to ever show us any results? Um, so this is the, uh, no, the white or no treatment... Um, uh, controls and these are log values uh, because I've discovered everything in the universe appears to be log normal uh, and since we're uh, comparing self to self we expect one-to-one -one, um, uh, uh, results and in fact um, so here's the here's the actual value from the standards uh, reading off the label and here's what we measured and and the assay told us was in there and so you get very nice relationship and actually you get the same slope no matter what you do but you can see that no matter what time period that we looked at all these curves for IL-1 beta pretty much overlap and they all have the same slope but what you, what you see down here is that there's a difference in intercept. And this intercept difference, this is a natural log scale. So what that means is that your level of detection has increased by about a factor of two. So if your level of detection is you know, one picogram, then now your level of detection has risen up to two by the use of uh, this amount of or this amount of time exposure to tween 80, 1%. Okay. For TNF alpha, remember there were some questions just looking at the raw data. What we see is that there's the same issue. So the, the, the standard curves all look about the same. And you can tell that we're not faking things because uh, the data aren't perfect here. These are pipetting errors, basically. Uh, but the slope is very nice. 
Um, but the intercept now, this is like one and a half or so, 1.25, and so now your level of detection uh, has risen by about a factor of two and a half to three. Yeah, a question? Oh, so we're we're measure so what the zero I'm not showing zero because that's below the level of detection no matter what, right? Even under ideal circumstances, you never get down to zero. Um, even even well I know this is logged, right? So you could have like a one there and then you take a log and it goes down to zero. But basically I'm just showing you for the extent of the standard curve that we had. Um, and so you can see you can see that for um, for the zero hours for TNF alpha, you've got this lo loss of sensitivity essentially, and then once you start getting data points again, you do have the same slope, but you really can't make uh, a determination of actual concentration down in this range. So it's not just that the intercept has shifted; that's actually the best case, but that the actuality is that it's gotten a lot worse than that. So now we're talking. With the other concentrations, we're talking about three, four, five uh, log units. So we're now talking about factors of 10 to 20 increase in level of detection. So I would say that that actually means that under these conditions, this is not a very good assay unless you have whopping high concentrations. If you do, you can still use the test, but you still have to look very carefully because on the next slide, so this is the um, high concentration uh, analytes. So the interferon lambda 2.3 has pretty good behavior. Um, it has a very small loss in level of detection um, with this intercept change and the slopes all look pretty good. But you begin to see that oh, for some periods, uh, you can see that the slope actually changes a little bit. And then when you look at interferon gamma, you can see that actually it's, it's not quite that simple. So for interferon gamma, the level of detection actually wandered around. Uh, it wasn't necessarily constant and it went up and down depending on the time of exposure. So the slopes also you can see that there's some variation in the slopes. And what that means is that if you're going to use interferon gamma assays after 1% tween 80, you, have to, you really have to have two sets of standards, uh, one with and without the tween 80 and that in order to understand what it's done to your assay. And that gets to be very, very difficult. All right, so um, we switched over to testing fixatives. Actually, we were doing this simultaneously. Um, and the literature says that there are unclear results, basically, with, um, with formaldehyde. Glutaraldehyde, the data suggested that uh, it's effective after 24 hours, but the, the literature wasn't all that clear in terms of what concentrations worked. Um, there are some more recent papers looking um, at embalming fluids, so time is not uh, a huge hurry in that setting. Uh, there's fixation in terms of vaccine development, but vaccines are developed and kept on a shelf and continue to be exposed to formaldehyde until the moment it goes into your arm. And that's part of the reason why it hurts, is that there's a little bit of formaldehyde in there. Uh, and so you're talking about dwell times with the formaldehyde for you know weeks to months, possibly years. Uh, so you don't really have to worry about how long does it take to kill the virus. But again, we're talking about a lab where you want to process samples in some reasonable amount of time. Um, and, and so the data about you know, quick turnaround was just missing. It was all about multi-day exposures. So we got our friends at Utah State University. Uh, Brett Tarbett, uh, or, sorry, Bart Tarbett uh, runs, is one of the directors there. And um, I happen to know him. And he's been doing viral inactivation studies for 30 years. And so he took this on because um, I asked him, and he's a nice guy. And uh, he looked at uh, three different things. So formaldehyde at 0.037% is a number pulled out of the air because it's been in use um, in the literature for vaccine development. 0.008% was pulled out uh, from papers looking at SARS, and so that's 20-year-old data. And we basically said, okay, if you expose SARS-CoV-2, and so he has a BSL-3 lab, right? I, this is dangerous. 
Um, and he basically took standardized solutions containing active virus, looked for activity. The activity assay is after you clear out the formaldehyde or glutaraldehyde, you take what's left, expose uh, Vero E6 cells, and see how many plaques you get. And basically, um, this is the control. So there is some loss of virus over time with just storage, but that's two days and this is plenty to get you sick. With formaldehyde at 25 degrees, which is the easier condition but not so good for bioassays, it took at least 24 hours to reach the limit of detection, which means that your biosafety time is 48 hours. With glutaraldehyde, it turned out to be 15 minutes. And I thought that was amazing. So glutaraldehyde is not used very commonly. Um, it's great if you do electron microscopy. Uh, it comes as a 25% solution. That's like a 10 mil 25% solution. So you can, uh, I think, I might be off by a decimal place, but I think out of one vial you can make about 30 liters of this stuff. And so for each condition you might need, you know, uh, a quarter of a mil or something like that. So you can make an endless amount of, of this stuff. And the time to biosafety is about 30 minutes, which is really good news because if you do this, you just have to wait 30 minutes and then you can go on with the rest of your assay. Okay, uh, this is the four degree data. So this is actually even better because if you have a sensitive assay that can't be done at room temperature, even for 30 minutes, you can put it in the fridge and it's not a problem. So glutaraldehyde works at 15 minutes to level detection and then the biosafety limit at 30 minutes. Uh, formaldehyde, not workable really. And of course, uh, I guess the virus really likes four degrees. All right, so we took that data and we said, okay, if 30 minutes is good enough, then we actually want to know what's the other end of the time, right? So if you bring it in in the evening and you start your assay, can you store your assay overnight and still have results in the morning to look at? And the answer is yes. So basically at all times, if you do the exact same plots I showed you before, I'm just showing you the 16 hour incubation time, basically, the level of detection has not changed. The behavior of the curves has not changed. It's basically the case that you could ignore the fact that you have 0.008% uh, glutaraldehyde in there. Uh, I, I think you still have to do the control that way, but I don't think you have to worry about the glutaraldehyde completely distorting the plate. And um, just the last bit of data, right? So we collected all these samples, and uh, what I've been showing you is under the best of conditions. So nothing else is in there. No crazy proteins, no crazy medications, depending on the patient. So these are um, samples from uh, real patients that I selected out of our collection. The COVID positive are in red, the COVID negative are in the blue circles. And we subjected them to glutaraldehyde as well as tween 80 to see what would happen. And it's actually kind of nice that the samples more or less uh, are associated, but there's two groups of results on here that I want to bring your attention to. So these uh, samples are at the level of detection and I have assigned them the value for the level of detection uh, when they are assayed by glutaraldehyde conditions. The problem is that when you assay them with tween 80 in the mix, you actually get real values. So same thing over here. Th this is actually two points. There's two more points here. These were assayed with tween 80 and gave you level of detection numbers, but you actually got real numbers when you used glutaraldehyde. So I think what these results show you is that in general, you get a fit between the two uh, methods. The uh, R squared here is about 0.65, so not tremendous when the, the molecule, the samples are theoretically identical. Um, but the concerning thing is that, oh, there is some idiosyncrasy of the samples because these samples worked great under tween 80, these samples worked great under glutaraldehyde, but they're non-overlapping. So that's just a word of caution, right? Um, all right, so I have some conclusions. Um, I think that if you're going to use tween 80, you're going to increase the level detection by a factor of two. 
Um, TNF alpha, the level of detection, is going to go up and it's variable depending on the incubation time and it's also uh, going to be quite insensitive. No distortion, it's still pretty linear, but a lot of caution. Glutaraldehyde is, appears from those control experiments to be a whole lot more um, reliable. So minimal changes in level of detection, no distortion or loss of sensitivity with the standard curves. It's actually really cheap. Um, but there's still this issue with sample and uh, inactivation interactions that, uh, you know, I'm not sure we can even investigate that because it's, it's down to individual variation. So what I would recommend, and it's just a recommendation for me, so, you know, if we get this published, maybe it'll be stand a little stronger, use glutaraldehyde. Uh, it's a little safer, it's cheap, it's easy to do. You don't have to worry so much about the control curves. If you need to do inactivation of your samples before you do your immunoassay, then the choice actually is the tween 80, but you're going to be in for a fair amount of pain with the, um, with, with the analysis. You're going to have to do a lot of control curves to make sure that you're going to be able to interpret the results. If you only need inactivation before you use a flow cytometer, because those some of those machines create an aerosol, creating the hazard, then you should use the glutaraldehyde. If you don't worry too much about handling live samples inside your lab, then you can use the glutaraldehyde as well, right? So the, the, what I'm getting at is that before you do the biolegend assay, if you need it inactive at that point, you have to use something like a detergent. If you use a glutaraldehyde at that point, I don't think it'll work. If you, if you can do the sample handling in your lab safely to the point of the flow cytometer, then you should, use, then you should do your assays in the BSL2 plus manner, inactivate them for 30 minutes, and then you can read them in the flow cytometer without too much trouble, and you don't have to worry too much about safety. Right, remember the caution from my friends at USU, you know, just because we can't detect it doesn't mean it's not there. So you still have to be cautious, but it's at least a whole lot safer.